Soccer Today is powered by Spin Media. From podcast to video production, visit SpinMediaDigitalSolutions.com and bring your content to the next level. Ya lo hace. Pierna derecha, directo al arco. Golazo. 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 The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Rollins and Kevin Laramie, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. Good day, good night, welcome to Soccer Today for Monday, July 25th, 2022. I'm Kev Larmay and I'll be joined by Dwayne Rollins in a second as we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube page and join us in a journey to a thousand subscribers as you click on that notification bell to be made aware of whenever we upload a brand new episode. Speaking of episode, busy day today as we break down the breaking news of the day, the official loaning out of the Golden Boot leader in Major League Soccer, Tati Castellanos, on his way to La Liga. His journey will continue on the Iberian coast. When we look at now the NYCFC and others, we'll have a great topic of conversation later on. And TFC, of course, the Italians made their debut and we'll break it all down with, of course, Dwayne Rollins. As always, Dwayne, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. I'm just, uh, recovering from heat stroke, I think, because I did the double on Saturday and. 40 celsius <laughs> temperatures so yeah that was fun it is a uh, very very hot 40 celsius it is of course a heat wave in the northeast of the north american continent and europe and everywhere else on the planet pretty earth. much it's a heat yeah earth earth is in a heat wave right now it's uh it's quite a climate change what are those yeah exactly what are those They're, that doesn't exist let's look at the overall score actually no you know what let's start with the breaking news let's start with tati castellanos on his way to europe a news that we knew was going to come Dwayne. it was kind of alluded to last week by the caller commentator in Spanish, Roberto Abramovich, fan of the show. He's been on the show before. And Roberto Abramovich reported last week that this will be the last match of Tati Castellanos. Fans knew at the end of the game, he uh, did a lap around the field celebrating and clapping and had an ovation. This was a proper send off by the fans. And we see here his stats in Major League Soccer updated as of right now. And I included the Golden Boot and MLS Cup because he was instrumental last year in the qualification of NYCFC for the playoffs and in the playoff, his great play all the way to MLS Cup. He lifted the Golden Boot. He lifted MLS Cup last year. It was his glory time. 116 games, 96 starts. 53 goals, 20 assists. That's 73 goals and assists with 116 games. That's about 0.72 goals and assists per game. Quite a production by Tati Castellanos in New York. Yeah, I mean, you, when you're talking about your goal scoring, it's a one and two player almost, like a little bit more in terms of the amount of games. But I always use the measure of one and three. If you're a one and three goal scorer, you are top class. You are a star in this league and any league in the world. And, and he's, he's performing this in the CFC. What, I mean, we've known this is coming, I think, for a few weeks. We weren't exactly sure what it was going to do. And I think that they held off as long as they could to to maybe find a sale for them. The the move within CFG, uh, C Football Group, is, I think, them punting him down the road for another year to see if they can get some money out of that to get some more income. As it relates to the MLS side of things, it doesn't really matter. New York City UFC will get enough of a transfer, of sort of a loan deal here that they will get the value back in allocation. So in terms of the, uh, the MLS side of things, they're going to be taken care of. But C Football Group wants to reinvest the investment look he's gonna be hard to replace and kevin i think that the biggest question that we're going to have to answer after we sort of celebrate what he did for nycfc is what this is going to mean for the eastern conference yeah and i think the biggest winner right now has got to be the philadelphia union who continue to just sort of turn along at their little solid level and when they take a big star <laughs> in the league it's true you know yeah well you're right we see the standings in the eastern conference as you speak because Philly's first with 42 points, and NYCFC is second with 41 points. By the way, in his last match against Miami, Tati Casanonos did play well. He got an assist in his last match, a victory against Miami FC. As we see here, great numbers. A goal by Maxi Morales and Hebert and Tati Casanonos. Two created chances, four shots, one shot on target. We also have two key passes and one assist, and Miami struggling to get out of... Uh, 
of a difficult situation. Pozuelo will eventually be good, but we'll see. It might take a couple of weeks for this team to gel. But anyway, CFC second in the Eastern Conference and now without the Golden Boot leader in MLS. And that's, to me, the troubling thing here. People look at this trade or this transfer or this loan, actually, from the outside. And they're like, look, a team is trading away their best player. They're letting him go for almost nothing for the rest of the season. He's on top of the league for the goal scored with Sebastian Driussi, 13 goal scored. The optics are a bit different. If you're an NYC fan, you're you're thinking, is, is this them punting on the season? Of course, you can't say that. They're second in the Eastern Conference and they're in the race for the Supporters' Shield. They're only four points behind LAFC. But when you look at this, Dwayne, is it a possibility that for fans might take this the wrong way? New York fans were pretty celebratory. I watched that game. It was one of the games I watched in full this week. And, and certainly the NYCFC fans beloved, loved this guy, and they were giving him all their love on Saturday. Standing ovation when he came off. They, they took him off with enough time that they could kind of give him the opportunity to, to have that send-off, to tip his hat, so to speak, and all that. Um, how are they going to react to this? I think there's some frustration in terms of the fact that this is uh, that, that they, they all realized after they won the title last year that once the CCL was done that they would be looking to move him and and I think most uh, most fans of MLS are sophisticated enough to understand where the league sits in the global market and understand that players like that are going to look to move up and I, I think the frustration will lie in the fact that they might not view this as a move up now. Look, this is a recently promoted team. Um, in a, a lovely part of Catalonia, uh, right in the Pyrenees. It's, 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 it's a lovely little place to go, but at any rate. <laughs> it's, it's the cycling hotbed of Spain. If you're a cycling fan, this is where all the cyclists actually reside during their training time. Yeah, it, it, I've been to this. It's a lovely little Spanish village. It's a, it's a nice little lifestyle change. But this is a you know city football group money came in, brought this kind of traditional second division team up to La Liga. They will be struggling to to they're not Real Madrid, right? But they are going to be playing Real Madrid. And I think when you're looking from City Football Group's perspective, that's what this is about. You're going to put him in a mirror and in a shop and have him out there so that teams can say and say, well, you did an MLS, we're not sure. But if he's doing it in Liga 2 for this side, then they're going to go, okay, then this yeah. is guys worth a punt. But from the NYCFC perspective, yeah, they've got to trust that City Football Group, though, that they have another shoe that they're moving around because that's what they do. And their scouting network is what makes them what they are. The scouting network is what makes this the best team over points since 2015, I believe. So you got to trust them. They they've earned that trust at this point, and we'll we'll see what happens here. And, and you know, I wouldn't. I'd be pretty surprised if we go much more than a couple weeks before a player is announced for them that we'll all go, who? But then he might step in and be yeah. a star because that's what they do. Well, just when Casanos arrived, it wasn't like it was all oh, the, the this biggest superstar in the world. But it'll be interesting how New York replaces his contribution this year. Once again, it's 13 goals so far to replace. He might be in the top five of the Golden Boot race at the end of the season, only playing half of the season. <laughs> that's the amount of goals he scored. But we'll see if NYCFC is able to replace him moving forward. But they are, of course, second in the Eastern Conference. It's not... They, they do have a little bit of leeway and a margin of error, even if they lose a few matches and the time they find that chemistry. Speaking of chemistry, a team that found chemistry on day one of passing to the Italians, that is Toronto FC. This is becoming not only a meme, but reality. Let's have a look at a surprising aspect of this game, Dwayne. Of course, talking about Bernardeschi, I'm talking about Lorenzo Insigne. And in an, on another day, Dwayne, we'll talk about Crescito, because Crescito might be the best of the three, in my mind, long, long term. But I want to start, before we break down the score and the game, I want to look at Federico Bernardeschi and Lorenzo Insigne's performance. I want to look at the Italians. Let's see who did pass to the Italian this weekend for TFC. So when I look at this one, and you can see it on your screen, the heat maps of Bernardeschi and Lorenzo Insigne against Charlotte. And of course, it's a 4-0 win for Toronto. Two goals by Michael Bradley. Surprisingly enough, but what you see on your screen might explain in a bit why he was higher up there. You don't see Jesus Jimenez's heat map and Michael Bradley heat map. Uh, maybe in another day we'll break it down. But you see here how deep both Italians came into this game. Bernadeschi really going deep in his own territory as a right attacking player in a 4-3-3. Tracking deep, 
overlapping with Osorio. Osorio scored in this one because of the overlapping and the help there. You see this on the right side. And on the left side with Insigne, you see the same, but you see even more contribution by Insigne on higher up in the pitch. Bernadeschi has more contribution in the box. He finished there and he's on control of the corners on that side. And you can see that Insigne is definitely in corner in, in control of the corners on the other side. I think it's fascinating how when you look at Insigne, you can also add Crescito who has the same kind of heat map, but even more box to box. So that's interesting to me. The playing in the midfield and up top by the Italians. Who is the new nickname of Toronto, but especially of Bernadeschi and Insigne? Uh, yeah, and so they were joking on extra time that there's no team and uh, well, no fans in MLS more served than uh, Italians in Toronto. I mean, basically, it's like their dream team is coming here to play. It's the Italian national team, uh, for God's sakes. But at any rate, look, uh, it was a nice day at the stadium uh, after what has not been a great year. And you look at these two these two heat maps and you think about the positions they're playing within Bob Bradley's system. And then you realize that at the start of the year, the total age of the two guys playing both of these positions was less than 40, right? Like you put them together, you had a teenager and a 21-year-old up there. They, there's no doubt they were struggling. And this is part of the problem, why it's been so difficult to handicap TFC in a true way. You could only say TFC is not good now, but they're also not complete. Well, this is the first sort of indication of what they might look like complete. Is this going to matter in terms of uh, this year? Uh, I don't think so, but we'll see. <laughs> exactly. It might be too little too, too late, but you're right. And you know what? We'll, we'll even go and we'll have a tactical conversation here. As you see the starting 11 on your screen on YouTube, if you're watching us via podcast, I'm talking about Mark Anthony K and Jonathan Osorio in particular. A couple of weeks ago, when they were both played at the same time for the first time for TFC, they were inverted. Mark Anthony K was played out of position on the right. Osorio was played out of position on the left. The, the output was terrible. It was a terrible performance by Toronto. They lost that game handily, heavily also. We've seen the adjustment with Michael Bradley in the middle, Mark Anthony K as the left midfielder. That's where he was used by Bradley, uh, sorry, by Bob Bradley with LAFC. Sometimes. Most times it was in the midfield where Bradley is playing, where Michael Bradley is playing. I'm going to say Michael and Bob, okay? Because we're going to get confused. So Michael, where he's playing, this is normally Mark Anthony K's preferred position under Bob with LAFC. But a few times he used him as a left midfielder, which is the case here. And Osorio is better suited on the right to put the ball in his right foot and be able to finish and have a bigger opening towards passing lane and towards the net. We see the result with Toronto scoring a great goal and who else but Osorio to play well when he's in position and of course inspired by the Italians. Well, yeah, I mean, we should, we should note that the goal by Osorio was a little fortunate enough to bounce, but he was in the position to create the play. And certainly if you look at uh, Bradley's second goal, that would be absolutely the movement on the wings, creating the little flick on pass and the run by Bradley going into space does really show what kind of dynamic kind of movement and play you can get through Bob Bradley's system. We saw it at LAFC. We've seen hints at it with TFC during the year where they have looked offensively good at times, but not necessarily consistently. The game against Charlotte, Charlotte, obviously, in a very hot day. And once they got behind, it got a little bit of an overwhelming thing. So grain of salt and all that. But we saw a big hint of what this might look like when it gets firing. Um, the other part of it, too, is when you have this much pressure moving forward, you can't press up and you can't press Toronto the way that teams have been doing all year to devastating effect. And the clean sheet, their second of the year, their second in 40 games or something like that, is, I think, an indication of the fact that teams had, that Charlotte had to sit back a little bit more. Uh, they couldn't just do that sort of quick mid, uh, you know, mid -bra mid mid block and then try and press up uh, to, to get the, the turnovers to, to hit them quickly, like teams have been doing all year. That's going to be as much of a benefit to me as the attack can be in a little way. But that said, yeah. Kevin, like, I mean, it, it the attack can be devastating and when you look ahead if you're a tfc fan you think about 2023 yeah and it's with a dp to add in here as well exactly. it can get pretty exciting it was a good day uh, we'll so, see if it's a six percent chance is what they call it in terms of the stats sure. stuff out there so we'll see so uh last year we knew javier perez was not coming back right so this year like if you're jesus jimenez if you're if you're him you gotta score almost every single game because well, there's a DP spot open, and it's going to be a striker. So if you don't want to lose your job, you got to score a whole lot. And that's going to be Jesus Jimenez's goal to serve the Italians to his right, to his left. Because if he does it, guess what? 
He's the one's gonna leave, not the other two. So, so that chemistry has to work for Jimenez. If not, well, you'll have somebody not named Jimenez there next year as a DP, probably. But we'll see if he can continue to play well. One thing I thought was interesting here is, of course, the two goals by Michael Bradley, Federico Bernadeschi, scoring on his debut, a first half to remember. But I'll put a little damper on the victory. Expected goals of 1.4 versus 0.7. This emphatic victory is a victory that is deserved. The four goals, though, that you gotta maybe keep some for, for other days. But it is a victory nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, some fans were complaining about the second half performance, too. When you pulled your two, two of your better players and have a cup final on Tuesday, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and you're up by four goals, there's going to be a little score effect pop in there. So, so relax a little bit on that and celebrate what was was a great first half. Um, Jimenez, to go back on that point, uh, the one thing I will say is Bradley did bring him in. Uh, so that is uh, one thing for him. But you're right, th that is a position that you would think of with money to spend. And TFC certainly has money to spend all the time, it seems, uh, that they will be targeting. Because, you know, that said, Jimenez has been good. I mean, he's not that far off that golden, that golden boot race that we saw earlier there. And if he starts to get service, just Nothing saying that he can't put himself back into that conversation with what I think is eight or eight goals down, nine goals, perhaps doesn't matter, but something pretty pretty solid. Um, look, the problem with this team, when you look at it, is that back to you've got Lucas Minot and God love him. He had played great in the CamPL and we support the CamPL. We've seen some success from CamPL players here. Uh, Mo, uh, Mo Farsi had his, uh, well, not his debut proper, but his debut as a signed player this week and played well for the last 15 minutes. Like It's, it's a good week for the CamPL, but you don't want to be relying on those guys to be your, your starting center halves, and that's not a championship level thing yet. He might grow into that, but he's not there yet. So they're going to need to address that too. There's still holes in this team. There's no depth at all, but that is <laughs> Attack. Exactly. It's pretty good. Exactly. And we'll see what it is the output of the attack later this year. And of course, we'll see if they can parlay this into a good performance in the standings. Let's take a look at the standings before we take the break. When we look at who's winning right now in the Eastern Conference, it is not necessarily what I would call a runaway, but there's three tiers of team. There's Philly and NYCFC who are on top with 42 and 41 points. We have New York third with 36 points and Montreal with 35. They're together. But Montreal has a game in hand versus New York and Philly. There's a gap of five points to Orlando, Columbus, Cincinnati. And then there's Charlotte with 26. Montreal has nine points between them and the first spot out of the playoff. That's a very good omen for Montreal. And we're going to talk about this after the break when we look at more of Montreal and the overall results in MLS. Because it was a busy weekend in Major League Soccer. And after this short break, we're going to break down every single result in Major League Soccer. We'll look at Montreal's big win on the road, a club record for the blue, white, and black. Another defeat for Vancouver. And we'll talk about Gareth Bell opening his MLS account and more after this short break. You are listening to Soccer Today. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Today SPN and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network. And we're back on Soccer Today. If you would like to subscribe to our premium podcast feed and get access to the Two Solitudes Soccer Podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash two solitudes. Latest episode is Dwayne and I breaking down the Canada soccer business deal of a few years ago, looking at the ramification on the Canadian men's national team and the entirety of Canada soccer with the controversy that's been happening over the last few weeks. You can find that and more on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash two solitudes. Once again, and if you would like to subscribe to the podcast you can do so everywhere you find your favorite podcast spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and of course spreaker and more of course on soccer today our website sportspodcastnetwork.com as Dwayne and i continue our look at the results in major league soccer it was a full week Dwayne. it was a full week of results and we have the results on our screen NYCFC miami we'll look at that result philly another big win for the philadelphia union they are slowly but surely just continuing to be one of the best teams, more consistent team. It's not necessarily flashy, but three points is three points. It doesn't have to be flashy. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that they're glad that the bar uh, assistant might not have been paying much attention at the end. Well, no, actually, the bar was. I don't know what the referee was looking at. If you don't know what I'm talking about, they're in stoppage time. Whole fistfuls of jersey apparently are okay to hold on in the box. I'm not an Orlando fan, so whatevs. But it was uh, certainly a call that I would have made as a referee. But nonetheless, uh, Philadelphia was the better team overall. And that night in our, right now, the best team in the East. Um, my issue with them, as I've been articulated before, is I don't know if they have that top, top, top end talent that can break open those high press, high kind of, sorry, high defensive oriented playoff games and kind of they call the game different in the playoffs. And I think you, you need a guy that can grab the game by yeah. the scruff like Josie Elstar <laughs> did in 2017 a couple times. Like sure. you need guys like that. And I don't feel like has them. That's my question in the playoff sure. league, but they are definitely in the role for the Spurs Shield. And it is definitely what Jim Curtin's done there. <laughs> over the past few years is, is really impressive. And and look, Orlando does have a lot to complain about in terms of what was a totally tor- terrible non-penalty call, but it was. Like, it, it was the wrong call. But overall, you know, it's one of those, like, it evens out over the course of the season kind of things because they were outplayed in yeah. that game at home. Exactly. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned Josie Altador. Let's look at what his new team has done. Uh, while they tied 0-0 with Columbus, Josie has not having a good year with New England. That's a euphemism. Uh, Josie, I don't know if we'll ever see Josie to the same level. And I actually do know we will never see Josie to the same level. That's okay. Father Time is still undefeated. But Columbus on the up and up. Columbus, New England, nil-nil. Yeah, I was joking with Kevin out there. Like, no, the one, normally my process behind the scenes is I will watch... I'll watch obviously the Canadian games in the weekend and then on Monday mornings I'll get up and I'll watch three or four games full and then blast through the extended highlights for the rest. And I have this innate ability to pick the nil-nils out because I don't generally look at the scores just to give me a little bit of conflict. Anyway, so I watch this game full, nil-nil. Uh, Josie is um, a shell of what he once was is really yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. It, it, and that's He's a beat up, like his body is not holding up. He was a great player. He was in MLS. He was a wonderful player. He, if there's a Hall of Fame, which there isn't, but if there was, he'd be in it. However, the end comes hard. Mother Nature, not Mother Nature, Father Time, Mother Nature, different things altogether. Hey, it, it still works though. Father Nature, Father Father Time is probably under the Mother Nature umbrella. If we, if yeah, we look they're, at, uh, they're both undefeated. This yes, is the exactly. point we're making here. If we're looking at the the extended God universe, they're probably related at some point. You know, they're they're. Yeah. They have to be similar. But I do agree, and let's continue in a second to look at some of the great results in MLS as I just take one second to say thank you to a great bunch of human beings. Thank you to our patrons that are subscribing to the shoutouts here at patreon.com slash two solitudes. With their contribution, we're able to do more and more. It's with their fin- financial contributions over the year that we're able to, to learn more about how to do proper video shows as you see nowadays and of course it's over the years with the great contribution from Pierre to Patrick to Martin, Jordan, Ian, Gonzalo, Glad, Dennis, Daniel, Sean and let's go boy Blue Collar Dan. Thank you for watching live Blue Collar Dan. Thank you for watching of course on YouTube. Thank you for subscribing to our shows everywhere and it's with their great financial contribution that we can continue to do more and more right here on soccer today as we go back and break down a couple of great results in mls cincinnati nashville 1-1 we've talked about toronto charlotte dc united montreal is the next one we're going to break down statistically and we'll also look at montreal's lineup georgie mihailovich is back in the starting 11 we'll break it down another defeat for kansas city as lafc won 2 nil gareth bell opening his account scoring after he was subbed in and of course he was subbed in for christian arango who scored the first game in the first goal of the game i mean and that will be the discussion in la those two will be fighting hard for playing time arango likes the fact that he has competition but he's been scoring a lot this year he's in the conversation for one of the best strikers in the league this year and gareth bell comes in his ego is maybe bruised arango and he's gonna score gareth bell will have to score to earn playing time uh yeah i i mean it's there was kind of a a bit of a mls headquarters must have liked that two and a half hour period between tfc's first half and bales getting his first goal not too long after that um it was kind of telling because you had these stars come in and in both cases they kind of instantly had an impact and and showed their class bail 
I would guesstimate, having watched the last 15 minutes or so, and I guess they put him in about 10 minutes to last week and about 15 this week, so they're creeping him up back into his shape. He looks like he's about 50%. He had a quarter look on that goal. It was a quarter look and he just perfectly picked it. His quality is clear. This is not like high-end analysis here. He's good. He's a very good goal scorer and he is going to tear this league apart if he gets fit and has motivation. If, 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 but... Exactly, because you know, we've seen yeah. him go back to Tottenham without motivation and he did nothing and then go back to Madrid. He barely played. We'll see if you're right if he gets back there. Uh, Seattle, Colorado, big win for Seattle. They did win even with a red card. Card, so that's a positive for Seattle back in the winning circle after two losses in a row in MLS. Seattle got a red card to Kellen Rowe. That'll be difficult in the next match. But a Jordan Morris goal and Nicholas Lodero. Of course, Lodero scores the one week I took him off my fantasy. But I still won my matchup, so it's fine. I still did well in my fantasy. Vancouver 1, Chicago 3. We'll break that one down. Let's just finish the other one. Salt Lake Dallas, big win for Dallas. Guess who scored, Dwayne? I did well for my fantasy because Jesus is with me. I have faith in you, FC Dallas. And of course, he scored the winning goal. Yeah, low key, uh, Jesus, low key uh, MVP candidate. I, I don't think he's quite there, but uh, low, for me anyway. But he's, if they keep scoring, Dallas is outperforming expectations. Dallas is one of those teams that ever since they had that supporter shield winning year, which was what? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, it was like 2016, I want to say, 2015. Uh, anyway, so since that, they've kind of been a nothing entity in here, but they quietly have put together a nice little team built on that model that they have down there. Very similar to Philadelphia. I'm sure that that's the way that they look at it, mm -hmm. how they can be successful and or, and they can maybe you know get players to score a lot of goals and sell them on. That, that's their model. But uh, yeah, Jesus is, is absolutely in the MVP conversation right now, <laughs> uh, as, as you might might think. Um, yeah, yeah that's quickly, that Seattle game, I mean, 2-1 doesn't seem that much of a result, especially at home. But if you watched it, my heavens, it was wave after wave after wave of this fast, fast, fast attack by the Sounders and against a Colorado team that just – is lacking something right now and I, I don't know whether it was like a outlier last year that allowed them to look better than they were yeah. or whether there's just something not firing right now but well like, you that can was tell a, uh, you can tell then when when you're not afraid to trade mark anthony k maybe your best player because you know nothing's going to happen this year you know you were far away and you you know you lost your window last year that was the window and they missed it last year yeah well yeah and you know the other side of that equation is that the sounders they're starting to roll. It, it was a really impressive performance overall. They, they 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 allowed kind of a it was a bit of a defensive hiccup. The first goal, Colorado took the lead, but after that, it was nothing. But the Sounders just attack after attack after attack. Yeah, a very impressive game. Watch watch that one if you have a chance to watch one replay of this game. Well, watch that one and you'll get a feel for the Sounders. It's pretty exciting to watch too. Another team that was fun to watch this weekend is Montreal on the road. A fifth victory on the road this year. A club record for Montreal. The first time in their history they have five away wins. And Ramel Kyoto, who else? First minute into the game, for the third time this season, Montreal scored into the first minute. Uh, quite an interesting statistic. And Ramel Kyoto scored his eighth and ninth of the season, his best season in his career for him in MLS. Steve Birnbaum cut the deficit to only one goal, but Montreal was able to hold on to victory with a 57% possession, 83% passing accuracy, winning the crosses and able to hold on even losing the expected goals battle, but winning by being efficient and defensively good. James Pentemis for the second straight game was in net and for the second straight game he has won in Major League Soccer after a clean sheet last week. It was the first clean sheet for Montreal since May 14th this time around, James Pentem has conceded once, but was able to keep it to that level. Four saves for James Pentem in this one. Big victory for Montreal as they continue to keep pace with the top dogs in the Eastern Conference. What I think is interesting is Gabriel Corbeau was inserted into the starting 11. Kamal Miller was suspended with a red card, having two yellow cards versus Toronto last weekend. Joe Waterman was put from the right of the center back position to the left of those three men back line. Kamasha was there in Corbeau, but they kept Johnston as the left wing back. And, uh, well, sorry, a right wing back, if you look at your screen. And this right wing back position is the preferred position for Johnston. He is so good using his left foot to cross it in or using his left foot to hook it back in and create space for him, for Toy, and for Georgi Mihailovic. 
a lot of those crosses that you see in the nine numbers in the stats here come from the boot of the Canadian international Alistair Johnston. Low key, high key, my discovery, not only this year, but over the last couple of years in Major League Soccer. Yeah, he well, he was the answer to the question that we were asking out loud when we were having Canadian men's national team conversations about a year and a half ago, well, two years ago now, right? Who, who's going to step up on the defensive side of things? Someone had to emerge, and well, suddenly this kid from played from Vaughn SC decided to emerge and and, and become a star. Um, question on on Waterman. Uh, it's yeah, I mentioned uh, McNaughton a minute ago, a Campiel grad that played a start. Waterman's going to start two two Campiel grads yeah. starting a, and playing at the back, and MLS is a pretty good pretty good day for the league for Campiel and the ability to develop does Joe Waterman okay he's not going to get a look on for John Herbin's not going to bring him in his temper he's not he knows what his players are but he should but he should because he's playing that well uh if you look at the statistics of uh, Joe Waterman he has about 88 percent dribble accuracy like he beats his opponent 88 percent of the time on dribble he has a very high accuracy passing rate this year he has a very high uh, tackle rate i think he's third or fourth for montreal for the amount of tackle this season that's very high and last year you had a lot of complaints about joel waterman we're not hearing any complaints this year and that tells you all you need to know fans are not angry at him he's playing well and he's versatile he's canadian that's a, a starting 11 player canadian versatile that's really, really helpful going forward for the game as national team. But for Montreal, it is very useful. And look at Montreal's defense. Rudy Camacho is French, but if you put Kamal Miller, Alistair Johnston, and Joel Waterman, and Camacho, that's your top four center half, I guess. Three of four are Canadian, and the other one is, well, Canadian to be. Maybe not international, but he only needs one more year of eligibility to be citizen. So you, uh, you have a lot of Canadian or Francophone qualities in Montreal. Yeah, well, fair enough, yeah. Uh, look, to finish the thought of Waterman, I, I, Steve Victoria will probably retire after the World Cup, I would think, from international play. I suspect on the Henry well as well. So there's going to be room for him in January. And if some injuries happen, you know, there is some option there, some de- depth developing, and that's that's a good thing. This wasn't supposed to be a Canadian national team conversation, but well, sure. here we are. Speaking yeah. of Daniil Henry, you mean newly signed Toronto FC player Daniil Henry. Yes, and, and breaking news, Michael Bradley was voted the MLS Player of the Week. I uh, just popped up on the uh, screen. And uh, breaking news, Kyoto finished just second. There, there you go. So, sorry, Montreal. Toronto voted you again. It was probably the fan vote because they guess were pretty this morning. <laughs> yeah, but the fan vote is very, very low in the, the, yeah. the parade, so it's, it's the media. But the media chose the Italian. Well, no, they chose Bradley. Well, I guess he's kind of like uh, an honor, honorific Italian at this point. It was it's the it was the narrative. Yeah. <laughs> All right, just before we say goodbye for today, let's look at the Vancouver and Chicago score to not forget about the white caps. Sometimes I think the Vancouver White Caps fans would like to forget about the White Caps. Because uh well they forgot to show up again. One three. Losing to Chicago. Uh the second worst team in the Eastern Conference. Sheridan Shakiri scored. Rafael Chicos, who's been really good recently, I have to say, and Chris Mueller, formerly of Orlando City, now with Chicago, scored. Chicago, a dominating performance, and yes, the XG for once goes on all the way to the way caps, but usually it's the other way around. This is a win for Chicago. Chicago gets a couple of uh, results in a row over the last week and a half, but Vancouver, another loss. Literally, but maybe too. I don't know if that's a word I just used, but when I look at the white caps, they are still in a good position, but they can't afford to lose too many points because they're gonna be out of touch. They're already four points away from a playoff spot with one more game played. This defeat against Chicago, a very bad team this season so far, could leave a lot of traces already in broad Vancouver. Four points and a game away from a playoff spot. Vancouver has to be perfect to get points. That That's the bottom line. They don't have enough talent up top. Um, they don't, I, I mean, in general, I didn't mean up top in, 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 in general sense, but they just don't have enough talent overall. That That's their problem. I mean, there's, there's, we've said this every week. There's no other way to break it down. You, their talent deficit. But, but look, they have played well, and we're going to give them praise for that. That is not a good effort in that game. Although, that said, the, the, bottom the underlying numbers are actually better than they usually are with the white caps are better than a couple of their wins where they had like two shots on goal and you know managed to score twice somehow like that that's not sustainable and and sometimes it turns around and, and you'll out xg a team and lose that that's soccer and that's what happened in this game here chicago 
Yeah. Maybe they're starting to figure it out a bit. I don't know. I think it's maybe they've been playing some weaker teams and getting some results against the weaker teams. So, yeah, oh, I wouldn't put much stock in that. Exactly. Uh, one thing I could say is uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps did have in mind the Canadian Championship Final yeah, that will take place tomorrow. Uh, by, the way, by the time you hear this show or tomorrow's show, it might be already time for this game. It is at 7.30 Pacific, 10.30 p.m., Tuesday, July 26th, Vancouver Whitecaps hosting Toronto FC at BC Place. The winner will lift the Voyagers Cup for the 2022 season. And that will be a very interesting matchup on Tuesday. And that's Vancouver's target and probably Toronto's target also. Well, yeah, I mean, it, realistically, especially for Toronto, as I said, the, the stats, when they run the models, Toronto qualifies for the playoffs 6% of the time right now. Now, they're probably internally think they have a chance, but by and large, this is the best chance to get, to get that glory. And when you're looking at TFC, particularly, they will want that CCL berth as a mar- as a recruitment exercise. They can go to a player, they bring in, yes, we missed the playoffs, but we qualified this way to go to the to Champions League. That word, those names, that makes sense to, to people that are trying to bring over. It's just another option for them to get a little more allocation to spend. Like, it's, it's a big carrot. And in Vancouver, they've only had it once before or twice before because they got it in that weird year where they just gave it to someone. Um, well, one of the weird years, they just gave it to someone. I have another scarf behind me for the other one. Anyway, but uh, they've had it a couple of times. They haven't done really well on it. Whether or not they have the resources to even want to compete in that, I don't know. But they're going to want to win this game at home in front of their home fans. Uh, you know, they have tried to make arguments to bring players. There's some promotions there that you can get by one, bring a friend kind of stuff. They're trying to fill BC <laughs> place up for this. Yeah. Uh, it. You know, it seems kind of anticlimactic for some reason, like it has been the last few years. I, I don't know what the answer is to that to bring back the spark in this tournament. Um, I think it has a lot of spark when Campiel versus MLS matchups happen, happen having been to a few of them now. Uh, maybe you need to create a situation where you guarantee the finals can, uh, Campiel versus an MLS team. That, yeah, that's then, manipulating it a exactly, bit. Exactly, exactly. And then it becomes yeah. okay, but what if, you know, it becomes, yeah, but you only won because you didn't have to be yeah. two or three, you know, so you, I think the closer to, it's not, we're not going to get deep in this conversation, but the closer to a pure form of open tournament you can get, the closest to it, maybe it might be the, not necessarily the fairest, but the reality they will do you want to have the best club in Canada winning because if you do so it has to be fair so yeah. there could be that but it'll be a good game tomorrow for sure yeah no look and, and TFC fans and Bank of Whitecaps fans will, will be excited about this when this game kicks off it's going to be a cup final and, and it will be competed as such having been at the Forge TFC game earlier this year which was a cup final without anything other than the trophy in the line it was intense once it kicked off it became something that players were playing for so look Tune in the game if you can. It's on one soccer exclusively. You can't get it anywhere else. So tune in if you can, and and we'll give it full coverage. We'll probably talk about this a bit more tomorrow. It depends on the timing of the show, but we'll, we'll talk about it. it. Depends on how long we can get a show in. Is what I'm saying. So we'll we'll give this more more due tomorrow. But yeah, it, it's a big game, and and two teams. One of these two teams is going to be playing the CCL next year, which you know may seem a little absurd to people, but that's how the birth works. Sorry, Montreal, you didn't beat. You didn't, no, exactly. Well, that's fine, you Montreal. Didn't put the Montreal could go into playoffs and do well and maybe qualify then. Anyways, uh, that, that is also going to be the yeah, case. Yeah, well, there's only one way to do that, so we'll see. <laughs> well, not anymore. Uh, it's, well, that's what I meant. You, you win MLS Cup, you win MLS Cup, you qualify in the exactly. new format. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. Montreal could do that now still. There's still hope yeah. for the future. But for now, if you want to follow more on Dwayne's thought on Major League Soccer and more, you can follow him on Twitter at 24th Minutes. Myself at Kev Larme and this show at Soccer Today SBN. You can find the podcast version of this show everywhere you find your favorite podcast. That is Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spreaker, amongst other places. You can also find advertising opportunities on this show. You can contact me at sportspodcastnetwork at gmail.com if you would like to add some visual advertising, some audio advertising, and more. We have some great packages available that will give you confidence in great advertising partnerships. And of course, if you would like to know more about everything we do, you can find all our uh, services from Spin Media Digital Solutions on our website, spinmediadigitalsolutions.com. Myself or somebody from my team will contact you if you want to bring your content creation to the next level. But as always, for Dwayne Rollins, I'm Kev Laramie. Until next time, have a great soccer. You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcasts.